Aloha. Today's episode is brought to you by the University of Hawaii College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources and the Livestock Extension Group. Aloha. Welcome, everyone, to the Livestock Balaao, a podcast aimed to provide educational support, information, guidance, and outreach to our livestock stakeholders in Hawaii. We are your hosts, Mele Oshiro and Shannon Sand. And today we're going to be talking about poultry nutrition with Dr. Rajesh Jha, who is a professor of animal nutrition with UH Manoa. Thank you, Dr. Jha, for joining yes. us today. And he, Dr. Jha has been with UH CTAR since 2012 as a professor mm-hmm. of animal nutrition, and I've been one of his students. He <laughs> has worked in various countries, including Canada and New Zealand, focusing on animal nutrition with a variety of livestock species. Dr. Jha, would you like to share more with us about your position at UH Manoa? Uh, thank you, Mele and uh, Senan. Uh, thanks for having me on this show today. It has been a really pleasure working with you both uh, for a long time and sharing our thoughts on different aspects of the livestock sector and other activities related to our college program. Uh, it's so nice to work always together, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and that's uh, something yes. fun to work with, you know. Yeah. And uh, when you look for my background, actually, I'm veterinarian turned animal nutritionist because some of you might not be knowing, you simply know I'm a professor of animal nutrition, but basically I'm a veterinarian. So actually, oh. I was born and raised in Nepal. You know, wow. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and after completing my veterinary degree, I joined public service like you people, mm-hmm. but with the Department of Livestock Services of Nepal and work there as a livestock development oh. officer. So I work around seven years there as a field veterinarian come livestock extension specialist, you know, oh, wow. nice. And it was really an exciting time, exciting job because you go to work directly with farmers, directly mm-hmm. with people, the stakeholders all around. And, and can make some difference, you know, direct difference to the farmers, you know. So when I was there, actually, I got very good understanding of livestock system. Why? Because I got to work in different livestock systems, mm-hmm. the heaviest type, you know, small scale to large scale, helping commercial program development to very backyard program development, you know. Those farmers were so diverse, you know. So this all kind of activities made me feel like, oh, that's, that's something to give farmer complete package. Mm-hmm. you know so this is how I started my career professional nice. career you know wow wow uh, yeah. I didn't realize that you worked in a very similar sector you know working yeah. in extension and outreach and and, I, and whatnot that's very cool I didn't that, realize that, that learn something reason, new every day right <laughs> you know, that's that's the fun part of you know, you know really, when we, we interact here we simply because we don't want to dig out that much in past because mm-hmm. we are so overwhelmed with current activities. Yeah. So we are like focused on what we are doing. Yeah. So when I came here, I started as a faculty. So my job is mm-hmm. more like, you know, uh, instruction, research. Mm-hmm. But my first love was extension. You know, honestly, I couldn't forget, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you remember your first class? That you never forget, yeah? So yeah. my professional career, <laughs> extension was my first love, yeah? So I worked mm-hmm. seven years. Despite I switched in research, teaching, mm-hmm. still so literally in the very first week I came Hawaii in Wahoo, in the very first week I was on Big Island in a yeah. farmer's meeting. Yes, nice. I'm telling on the record. <laughs> and thank, uh, thanks to other colleagues, you know, Dr. G and my, I used to work with Mark yeah. very much that. Mm-hmm. So I started working, although I have like my limited time with research ex, uh, um, extension services because of heavy load in teaching and research, mm-hmm. but still I couldn't give up the passion, you know. Yeah. And I started working with Parman and of course then in uh, rest is mm-hmm. the history, you know that how often we have been working together on different things, yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I still continue that to some extent as much as my time allows to the best yeah. of my time I do. Yeah, this is uh, something I'll say in brief. That's my background uh, uh, <laughs> rather than a researcher, more on extension part. Yeah, well, that's good. I was like, you have a lot of projects going on because I know Melly and I have both cooperated with you in the past and currently on a couple of different things. And like as far as a researcher goes, you I always feel like you you do a lot of stuff that like pulls in applied people like myself as like an ag economist and Mele as like an animal science background. So I was like, I always I don't know, I always really appreciate that, I guess. So, but yeah, you have so many projects going on. So could you share some of the projects related to poultry nutrition that you're involved in right now? De- definitely, definitely. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Anna. You know, it is the very good point. Again, it goes back to my background, as I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Broad base is always important, but main theme of my research is covering the different aspects of nutritional related science, you know? Mm -hmm. And this 
basically objectives are to conduct and facilitate both basic and applied research you know yeah. why because i want to answer some of the questions that are related to both local and global animal industries yeah. Yeah. and of public health importance and sanan you mentioned that you like why because the project's outcome directly relates to the people's life then it right. is of meaning you know yeah but if you yeah. go on my research program basically these are directed to our developing nutritional strategies you know mm-hmm. to enhance the productivity and health of monogastric animals so focus is there and that ultimate goal i want to develop this season models which can help oh, animal nice. nutritionist and the livestock yeah. industry to develop effective feeding program you know yes why that's important because the feed market is volatile you know very yeah. volatile especially here yes it like i mean it's volatile on the mainland right now and in the last um basically two years with everything that's going on i like to say B- bc things are bc before covid yeah it's like, and it's just i mean the, it's it's crazy <laughs> it's i agree like, with you senan but i would yeah. add there it's not only here actually it's global issue yes and 100% and also it's not only bc before before or after covid actually yeah. it is always the case but the thing mm-hmm. is only sometimes it's like big waves sometimes little small little waves, waves. yeah Agreed. that is very important another important thing is nowadays our livestock industry's biggest challenge is what we call farming in post antibiotic era you know means people are looking for fee, uh, animal based food which is produced without antibiotic right another part of the important concern yeah. which we all are seriously concerned is environmental issue yes we yeah. are sometimes blamed overly you know i, I don't oh, yeah. take that i don't accept that as some of the bloggers or some of the activists make the point yeah. but at the same time we as an animal scientist genuinely also admit some sort of environmental concerns are in our production system so mm-hmm. i want to develop the decision model that can fit not only to address the cost of the feed or cost effective yeah. production in this system at the same mm-hmm. time which is environmental friendly reducing less environmental burden you know mm-hmm. right that is one concern i have been working evaluating some of the alternative feed stocks you know oh cool so you know in hawaii yeah. we have to think how we can grow different kind of animals right. with mm-hmm. cost effective way Yeah. and we are struggling with the feed stuff cost it is the yeah. most important cost in our animal production system the highest cost you know basically yes. so yeah. that is the main focus so mm-hmm. determining nutritional value and also determining their optimum utilization in given condition that yeah. is something my main focus of the project of. and why as i mentioned all of this my work's motivation is to solve the need of current day consumers demand mm-hmm. what is the demand yeah. of healthy and environmentally friendly animal production system yes at the same time we want to maintain the industry's competitiveness you know yes yeah. because if the industry is not there how we are going to produce healthy or environmental friendly right yeah. agree our only surviving industry is not enough because we need to address the people's concern so that is the focus of my research program Yeah, so many projects. And I know you've had so many projects dealing with poultry and visited the lab with you folks and whatnot. So have you guys come across any um, things within your studies, I guess, looking at poultry nutrition and any deficiencies that were commonly associated with some of the systems here in Hawaii? A uh, very good question, Meli. You know, but unfortunately, what I will say, I don't have any straight answer for your question. <laughs> the reason is, you know, most of our Hawaiian farms are what a small scale family owned mm-hmm. right yeah. the majority of uh, if you see poultry farms hardly mm-hmm. there is any what i call commercial scale yeah. although officially they are labeled as commercial to some extent you know mm-hmm. in that case except few farmers mostly what they are doing feeding their animals or or poultry with whatever is around sometimes mm-hmm. scrap sometimes waste sometimes anything sometimes mm-hmm. even formulated diet they buy from you know the stores so literally in that case if they are feeding the formulated ration what we call the imported feed here in hawaii we use the word mm-hmm. then that case the feeds are what we call balanced diet that will meet the all the nutritional requirement mm-hmm. but if you simply give some sort of grain whatever you have around leftover or something right. then we cannot expect that it will meet all the right. nutritional requirement of your body yeah <laughs> but yeah. that impact for sure that is clearly visible 
you know, what mm -hmm. we call like uh, seeing the output impact based uh, information. So if you see our farmers, mm -hmm. chicken are not growing well, you know, in our commercial setup, in a well um, balanced formulation program or feeding program, literally in five weeks, now we are marketing our broilers. Market size is just in five weeks. Yeah, and those sure. farmers are not able to even harvest even after eight or nine or 10 weeks, yeah? Mm -hmm. Why? That is clear indication of that there is nutritional deficiency. Right, right, right. They are not reaching the potential of their growth, you know? They cannot, because nutrition is must to reach right. or utilize the genetic potential. Exactly. So I'm sure I didn't give you a straight answer, but I think you got what I mean. Yeah, here. no, but I think that that answers, I mean, that your last point about, you know, if your animals aren't meeting your expectations and growth, whether it be laying hens or broilers, you know, they're not getting the weight, you're not harvesting them at the date you are, you're not collecting eggs every day Got from it. them, then you need to address and, and think about what they're eating, what are they getting, how much are you giving it, and what are they um, missing? Adjust, anything, yeah, there's yeah. obviously a deficiency somewhere, um, nutritionally wise, that's leading them to not be productive and meet those goals. So, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great way to put it, you know, it's and yeah. sometimes mm -hmm. pinpointing a single thing is not, not it's a hard. thing. It's a, it's a, yeah. it's a group of things, it's right? So it's well, well, especially because sitting. we've got all the climates, the different Correct. like yeah. microclimates yeah, yeah. that exist yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's hard. I think I a common um, thing that I always see, you know, folks um, feel like, I don't know if it's like from books or from kid time and story time that you kind of think, oh, chickens just need to have like this cracked corn or um, fed scraps or things like that. And they still were producing, you know, or whatnot, when it really comes down to the protein content of what they're eating and, and their that ability for that to provide that nutrition, right? Am I wrong? Or is that kind of no, like where... No, no. You are absolutely right, Mili. I'm, I'm sure you remember uh, the course, uh, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. I was not going to point out here because we are colleague now, but you <laughs> mentioned you took my course, six, yeah. you know, 642 Advanced Animal Nutrition. If you yeah. remember some of the point I was talking, it's not that you just give cracked corn, it's not just yeah. give you like, just like a soybean meal or whatever, right? It's like simply think, if mm -hmm. I you offer you in the morning one plate of rice and the afternoon I'll give you a good barbecued chicken, in the evening, I will give you, you one bowl of salad. Is that right? We are feeding. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, if I merge this all kind of different feed and give you portion of that, mm -hmm. that is going to be violence, right? Mm -hmm. right. Very simple label language. I would yeah. Say. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. That applies in our animal case, you know, mm -hmm. chicken case or any animal basically. So now, farmers case, if you simply throw the corn, it's like simply I give you a rice to eat and you know, one big plate of rice. That's not going to fulfill your nutritional yeah, So no, it's no. about energy, you know, meeting protein, yeah. also meeting minerals, also meeting vitamins. The vitamins, all nutritional, what we call uh, six classes of nutrient, must be sufficiently meeting. Right. Also important is, you know, they will be feeding same thing to the broiler, same to the layers. That's not the same thing. Basically, you know, because yeah. of the age of your animal, because yeah. of the production status of your animal, that exactly. has to be changed. Same like in our human, you know, we don't mm -hmm. give the same food to our baby and same food to our elderly population or mm -hmm. somebody who is really physically working hard. Yeah. Yeah. So literally think a broiler, why? A broiler need to grow. So something feed that will help them to be muscle mass, right? Mm -hmm. Growth. At the same time, layers, you don't want something that will grow them bigger. You don't want to have 10 kilos, you know, um, chicken, <laughs> hen, <laughs> yeah, right? You yeah. simply want standard size, what is healthy, we call, at the time optimum. Then after, you want to focus to have more and more egg laying, right? Yeah. right. So your nutritional program should be directed toward maintaining their health. Don't mm -hmm. forget that though, okay? Still, the, the laying hen has to maintain right. their body condition, but focus is on egg laying regularly of good quality. Mm -hmm. So nutritional program will change based on the age, based on the sex, based on the production status. These all things. But farmers, as you mentioned, what will they simply throw some crack corn, yeah. something, something, whatever they have, right? Yeah. It's not their fault. It's because of our system, you know, because mm -hmm. back our farming system is like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Cool. Good points. Um, you yeah. you talked a bit about gut health too, as yeah. well, in your research and right. um, some of the focuses. So, how how important is that? I guess, and how much impact does promoting good gut health in your poultry um, impact their production? Oh boy, you <laughs> raise the point, which is literally what I call super hot topic these days. You know, yeah. all around, 
all around <laughs> even now as you mentioned even farmers are talking that forget about the scientific forum anywhere and, and believe me if you just go on my website you can see my topics of presentation all around oh, the world yeah. have given mm-hmm. more than half are related to nutrition and gut health Right. Yeah, I feel the like you were we, into probiotics for animals before people even knew it was a yeah. thing. Uh, <laughs> Based on when we, we went through and like we read that, your uh, site a little it bit. Had, it so. has been for a while, but yeah. definitely it was not as much as nowadays it is becoming popular. So oh, yeah. uh, I'm also not that young, you think. So definitely I'm working in this <laughs> for like well, <laughs> one and a half decade now, you know. So definitely when you see my name and you see like 15 years ago, I have a presentation on publication on that. It means I have been working on that for like more than a decade a while you know? yeah <laughs> a while yeah but you are right literally this was not that super hot no you know th- when yeah. you have problem then you find solution right so first thing you have to realize i want to say you why it is hot topic that's more important you know mm. why so much works are done why it is being discussed so much you have to understand the background of that why okay. you need to study and that is very essential now i want to remind you you know, Hippocrates, yeah. a great philosopher, all of us, you know, like right. we call um, 400 BC, I believe, yeah, or something like that. I don't uh-huh. remember. Mm-hmm. He has quoted, and I always remember his word, life sits in the bowel. You know, <laughs> in case you have heard this quote, Hippocrates. <laughs> and actually, that is my big mantra, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that is so, I, and the same I remember when I was a child, my grandma will tell you the same thing, basically, that, you know, anything, the root problem is in our bowel. So if your bowel is good, you kind of feel fresh. And believe me, it seems like kind of gross, but in the, a day when your bowel is not fresh, you don't feel fresh. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Nobody will probably admit like it, but that's different, so true. Like, <laughs> she, stomach surgeries, like joke, I 100% like, agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seems like joke, seems like yeah. light statement, but that is yeah, very no. serious statement. So mm-hmm. I didn't hesitate to use even uh, off the, on the record, you know? Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. Because anything and everything we eat goes in bowel, will be digested, absorbed, mm-hmm. and then used in our body function. Mm-hmm. If anything goes wrong there, no matter what you ate, will not be utilized properly. You know? Now, oh, yeah. that's the reason, whatever you want to eat, that need to be used by your body, and that is the gut function. But the problem here is, gut health, as you mentioned, Mele, uh, it is a hot topic, and uh, some of us mm-hmm. are doing, not only me, a lot of people are doing all around. Mm-hmm. But it's so complex, talked sometimes so lightly it's mm-hmm. literally it's not so easy it's really really complex topic that we need to discuss right. and people define it differently the biggest problem comes people define differently mm-hmm. why because some people take oh nutrient utilization some people will be talking about intestinal microbiota and they call it gut health some mm-hmm. people will talk about immune system they call gut health some people will talk about in intestinal barrier function all are right but it is not going to serve your purpose. Why? <laughs> because you have to see in a holistic approach. You want to see a whole elephant. So yeah. I believe gut health in a holistic approach. And whenever I work, in case you have seen my papers and works also, mm-hmm. I look all components and then see, does it make sense or not? So gut health, as you mentioned, we are thinking how we can create an appropriate environment, I use the word, or, or uh, like mm-hmm. efficient system in the site, got ecology, mm-hmm. so that you feed your animal, that will be used by it properly. And how it works, as I was talking one component, so literally mm-hmm. we know in our gut or intestine, there are trillions of microbiota, you know, and those are big players. Yeah. In general, whenever the word come bacteria or microbiota, we get kind of negative sense, right? Like it should be harmful. That's not true. There are some harmful bacteria also, but there are lots of beneficial bacteria also. Yeah. So in gut health, when you are thinking, your target is to support, promote the growth of those beneficial bacteria mm-hmm. and suppress the harmful bacteria right. or bad bacteria or whatever you name it, enemy bacteria. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And then that will help to boost your immune system. Immune system, you know, nowadays very common because of COVID also, you know, everybody have is yeah. talking, you know, boost your immune system. Yeah. So that is the capacity to fight against the diseases, you know. 
and that comes in different form you know it's not only one form you know so now mm-hmm. intestinal immune system is different you know it's a system you know it's not immune organ i use the word immune system yeah. because it's a system works in the, not independently rather with each other you know mm-hmm. communicate with each other response to each other yeah and that helps then another thing is you know what we call intestinal barrier you know in our intestine intestine is kind of now we can think of your water line pipeline in mm-hmm. your kitchen so whatever we are eating goes yeah. in but that from this pipeline need to go in our body right. what we call absorption right so proper digestion occurs in the lumen right that, that's pipeline but yeah. that need to go in our body inside to be used at the tissue level cell level right mm-hmm. so this all functions need to function in harmony right in balanced state then it is really good gut health contest and this is what we are working on you know nice my objective of this uh, research program yeah antibiotic free animal production system why because that is public demand yeah mm-hmm. because why because there are some concerns that suggest or actually there are evidences that when you are feeding antibiotic as a growth promoter some sort of antibiotic resistant bacteria will develop and that is impacting our public health yeah so you might have heard some country already banned use of antibiotic in feeds in us we only literally have we have not banned it fully but kind of regulated is fully regulated right. though 2017 only now looking for alternative to antibiotics you know ah. so yeah that is where your probiotic comes in mm-hmm. and probiotic is one of those alternatives it's not there are quite a few but definitely probiotic prebiotic organic yeah. acids these are major players and my works if you see as you mentioned lots of work with prebiotics and probiotics yeah. more with even prebiotics so probiotics are actually live bacteria itself but which bacteria which are beneficial as i mentioned mm-hmm. earlier some are beneficial some are harmful so mm-hmm. probiotics are beneficial bacteria itself that we feed so now they will go in the belly the gut yeah <laughs> they will make their empire you know they will colonize yeah. literally right. they colonize mm-hmm. make empire so now bad bacteria has no place out yeah this is the way you are helping your animal grow healthy mm-hmm. yeah but it's little different in prebiotic prebiotics are basically fibrous components basically the feed stops mm-hmm. but those are not digested by our enzymes the body enzymes neither in monogastric animals monogastric means pig poultry or we human yeah mm-hmm. but those bacteria in our gut will use that yeah. as feed so probiotic as i mentioned are the live mm-hmm. bacteria culture itself right mm-hmm. but prebiotics are feed for the bacteria in our gut you know mm-hmm. so literally those are basically carbohydrates you know in carbohydrate different types of what we call oligosaccharides those are mm-hmm. not digested by our body mm-hmm. enzymes mm-hmm. endogenous enzyme but are the food for microbes and those microbes will eat that and they will produce the compounds that is beneficial that we... for us uh-huh. okay mm-hmm. also now when they feed on it that create good environment now that again become good for other bacteria so it's kind of vicious cycle you know good good mm-hmm. good does good you know yeah so but you know earlier concept and still concept prebiotic is quite common if you go in the story mm-hmm. you'll find but then my research actually definitely i can probably tell you we are one of the few in the beginning now a lot of group does mm-hmm. started this concept not only us but few of us yeah around the world so nice. rather than having prebiotics isolated feeding your animal which is not logical for human is fine you buy a pills you buy powders right but you know can our feed stuff itself serve the same purpose or not mm-hmm. oh, that was cool. our hypothesis and we started yeah. working at during my phd actually that was the main theme although i worked the uh, like pig model you know i was using pig not poultry then yeah so and then we tested varieties of feed stuff which were like you know rich in fiber rich in resistant starch we call like fiber uh, especially those will have similar prebiotic functions like beta glucan we call you know yeah mm-hmm. and those are found in your barley oat you know primarily so yeah. we fed barley and oat and we tested in the intestinal environment you know nice. metabolites produce and the microbial changes and we found that works so nice. the same yeah same concept i carry on until now 
and i believe i will be continuing in future also because that is so huge that is mm-hmm. so important so important and yeah so any time when you see uh, by another big love with the word is by dietary fiber if you see in my all a lot of papers you know dietary yes. fiber <laughs> talks, that is the word why rather than buying the prebiotics from the store and feeding to your animal which is kind of not that practical or eating the yeah. diet why not to formulate ration or diet with fibrous feed stuff that will help your farmer. Well, that's that what I was, like I was going to ask. That was fine, like an optimal ration for this group Correct. of yes. pork in order to like maximize like feed efficacy, I guess. Yeah, very genuine question, Shannon. Yes, yeah. we did actually a lot of studies, a lot of studies, not only with pork, even with chicken here. In oh, Hawaii really? Also. Yeah. So what we are doing, varieties of feed stuff, including our some of the typical Hawaiian. Oh, and I'll give you the name. You'll mm-hmm. be surprised to hear that. Macadamia nut cake. Mm-hmm. You only heard macadamia nut chocolate, macadamia nut coffee, <laughs> macadamia nut tea. Yeah, I give macadamia nut cake to my chicken and feel oh. big. Yeah. You know why? When I came here, you mm-hmm. know, I visited to uh, our local uh, oil crosser in, uh, in Kunia, and they were throwing macadamia nut cake. And I saw, oh no, that is very valuable. Actually, they have to send to dumping site or landfill. And now, when it goes to landfill, means what? Environmental burden. You know, in Hawaii, yeah. we are on island. We have no land to fill. That is another burden. Although yes. small, but it's like significant contribution. So that I did a lot of work, analyze nutritional value, then functional value, then did trial with pig in in vitro model, also in the chicken. Mm-hmm. And we figured out you can feed the macadamia nut cake to your animal. And that has not only nutritional value, it's really rich in oils and protein yeah. also. Of That's course, what I was thinking. I was like, oh, it's high in protein, high in mm-hmm. like fat potentially. It and is, it would be it like is. super yummy. Yes. At the Warm. same time, because macadamia nut cake, which is like, you know, the sale, uh, after extraction of oil, mm-hmm. is rich in fiber. Now that helps to modulate beneficial bacteria, Benefic- help okay. the growth of beneficial bacteria. Nice. And that is one example I named you. We have done several other studies with different types of oligosaccharides and other fibers. Mm-hmm. And that found to be helpful in doing the same function, what we call prebiotics. Mm-hmm. So we have been using this model regularly using different types of isolated compound as well as our local feed stop or also like a common mm-hmm. feed stop, but with that functional value. So that's definitely a big topic mm-hmm. and also very important topic. The reason, again, same as I mentioned, because there is demand for right. animal produced without antibiotic, mm-hmm. right? Right. And that can be made by using these, some of the alternatives, resources, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think the mac nuts, I was like, I know there are like pork producers, is it in Portugal that feed acorn? So, and I know the mac nuts are really high. And I was like, even the cake, I would imagine it's a really high quality, like meat product or protein product. <laughs> Oh, yes. You know, is it that way with the poultry as well then, or just, uh, or that's it... right. Okay. Actually, we did a trial, even uh, study, even mm-hmm. with the farm condition. I used, actually, what you see in my background, as I mentioned, pasture chicken, thanks mm-hmm. to our farmer, you know, he cooperates uh, Julius uh, with me. I work with him for like uh, continuously. We are working for last nice. six, seven years since I came actually. Oh, that's great. Wow. We did a field trial there, not yeah. only in my farm trial uh, on campus, because on campus a research environment in practical application yeah. using macadamia nut. And we found if you use up to 15% of macadamia nut, your animal will grow very well without compromising growth performance. You know, oh, that's good. And remember, you may think mm-hmm. it's 15%. But yeah. 15% is a significant contribution. Mm-hmm. When you are counting for single penny and cents, mm-hmm. that is going to contribute your cost reduction. At yeah. the same time, two more benefit, not only cost. One was that environmental thing. Remember we talk, we now in Hawaii, not a single pound of macadamia not go, uh, cake goes to landfill. All are used by our pig farmers, mostly by pig. Why? Because they have relation with this, uh, you know, miller and it's mm-hmm. not evidently available. It's not sufficiently available now. Now, rather than going in landfill, they are in queue. Can I get it? Yeah. All done. Yeah. Problem yeah. solved. Second thing, health benefit. As I mentioned, this is giving you functional benefit, promote yeah. the health of your animal. So all the way, and that's not the only one. There are several we have done and found to be useful. Yeah, that's good. That's so good, right? To have those connections and have farmers yeah, being is. able to, 
you know, improve all those things, not putting that extra stuff in the landfill and using yeah. it for mm-hmm. production. That's awesome. So it does. Um, so I know like when we feed, when we've had wild pork that have eaten mac nuts and whatnot, it changes the quality and the taste of the meat. How does the, does the mac, have you found any differences in the meat quality of the poultry that's influenced by feeding the mac nut cake? Very nice question. Uh, Billy, I have no data to give you because I have not published publicly yet, mm-hmm. but we did that. We thought this question in the very beginning because I yeah. was thinking from animal nutritionist point of view, but mm-hmm. at the same time, as I mentioned, I always think of consumer, you know, right. and we did that actually from the field trial, well, what I showed, uh, discussed you earlier. Uh-huh. At that point, we collected the meat sample also. And on campus, you know, our we have uh, in our mm-hmm. department sensory, uh, sensory panel review team, yeah. Oh, nice. They did sensory evaluation. So we have not statistically analyzed the data, so I cannot tell you exactly. But what we got in the, what we call preliminary data, yeah, mm-hmm. it's no complaint. Actually, people liked it, but there is no any formal thing I can tell you it is superior or not. But yeah. definitely, it is not inferior, and that's expected because mm-hmm. macadamia not contains, you know, yeah. high amount of that, unsaturated that good. Good yeah. for health. <laughs> Yeah, no? I definitely think with pork, like even the, the the wild pork, when you've had it and it's been on mac nut, it's way better. Than I was going to ask you Malay, what your opinion better. was. That's yeah, good... that's why I was like, it's got to be good for like, I would think for poultry mm. and the meat quality and even like probably the eggs. Right. I mean, uh, I've, you know, I've had eggs, chick- eggs. I don't know. Eggs, I don't know because we have not tested any. We have oh. not done any studies, so I cannot tell you when you ask me. Mm-hmm. But chicken, yes pork yes i can confidently tell you because mm-hmm. we have we have already tested we have done trials actually mm-hmm. pork our farmer you know here in uh, wahoo mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. two of our farmers on um, why not they are regularly using mac nut cake in their feeding program and i have been working with them um, nice. from the very beginning since i came literally very first week i met them very yeah. first week i went to ni since then we are regularly working so that is working and that is mac nut is literally as you are um, as you mentioned it's right it helps to improve not only the growth, but also the quality of the meat. Yeah, that's no, good. I cannot tell you pinpointing what exactly attributes, mm-hmm. but what I can assume because uh, macadamia nut cake is rich in unsaturated fatty acid, which mm-hmm. is what we call healthy fatty acid, mm-hmm. unlike mm-hmm. saturated is not. So that yeah. will be, and fat is always transmitted in the meat. That we have proven in our right. previous studies, you know. So I can assume, although I don't have data, I can assume that will be translated and will be better meat. Mm-hmm. That I'm, mm-hmm. I'm very confident, uh, although I don't have any data. I feel confident, though, you know. Yeah. That's my experience. <laughs> yeah. <not data>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I yeah. think some of the anecdotal stuff is important as well, right? Because we see it and it's common yeah. around other other species yeah, 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 as well. Yeah. So that's right. Yeah. yeah. I think backyard, you know, poultry production has has grown, um, yeah. you know, over the past few years. And I would think even since the pandemic, more people are starting to produce stuff in their backyard and whatnot. Oh, yeah. So. Um, what kind of tips can you offer for the poultry backyard, uh, I guess, poultry producers, as well as our large uh, producers out here in Hawaii, as far as maintaining um, poultry health and nutrition in their flocks? Uh, let, let me separate your question into two set here, okay? First on backyard, then on commercial or large scale or general. First thing, okay. if you see a backyard, definitely that's something what I call exciting and positive change, you know? And we are seeing Hawaii. And recently, I saw one, one of our local uh, news article also was a big on backyard farm, you know. And mm-hmm. people have started doing that here and there all around, you know. And it is contributing positively, you know, in the local meat production, especially pandemic has created so much supply chain disturbances. Oh, and my also, God, yeah. Always we are, Hawaii always food insecure. So even a small contribution is big contribution. You know, yes, I, I right. firmly believe, you know, some people will say, ah, it's just a small. No, a small, a small makes a big, you know. Mm-hmm. One meal to... So my suggestion will be backyard farmer, although they are just having a couple of birds or little, maybe just 5, 10, 20, yeah, still they should know how to do farm. Still they should know the basics of poultry raising. You know, mm-hmm. they doesn't have to know the rocket science. They don't have to know all the details. And we are here, you know, we, we sit our is here, you people are there, I am here, all of us, our team is there to help them. Anywhere they shout, we are they're always there. That yeah. we are proud of that. We have been serving our Hawaiian farmers, yeah? We will always help them. Mm-hmm. One important thing I'll say, they must maintain biosecurity protocol. Even they have only one chicken. Yeah. One 
single chicken can create big problem for all around whole we are mm -hmm. island a small state you know if any disease comes one or other way now in that case that can create a big problem for us mm -hmm. so i will suggest first thing first make sure to maintain biosecurity and biosecurity protocol on their farm and yeah. we are here to to help them develop right. their plan although it is small farm it's very simple it's not complicated no you know yeah second thing is that they should routinely practice vaccination program health checkup although they have only few boards you know and that is sometime overlooked simply think ah i have just a small flock you know it's, it's not big deal but a small can create big problem that we have and another beauty of that or benefit of that if they do this practice mm -hmm. no need to mention good feeding practice naturally i'll be advocating that by default <laughs> yeah and we yeah. have been talking that yeah that will also help them so it's not yeah. going to harm them even a small investment on that vaccine or drug is there but that is going to help them to grow efficient mm -hmm. better mm -hmm. animal you know and yeah. that is important right. so that will be my suggestion to backyard farmer so literally even you are having a small flock maintain biosecurity protocol mm -hmm. regularly maintain vaccination and health measurement plan and also feed them at the best you can with balanced ration yeah then they will harvest the efficient and good quality meat in very short period relatively that will be my suggestion for backyard farmer for commercial farmer we have lots of resources all around mm -hmm. and for commercial farmer definitely i will say if you want to do business do it if you don't do then don't do it it should not be hobby farming commercial farmer should go in very details plan each and everything of course business up to business plan with san energy export i'm not <laughs> no. Yeah, no, 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 export of that. Not me. I don't know about those kind of things. But in general, what I can say, because you are in business, remember, livestock farming is a business enterprise. Mm -hmm. If you yep. can make money, then only you can sustain in this business. Then you can continue it. If not, you will be out of business after one or two cycle. Yeah. Do you think that hurts to the farmer? No. That does not hurt to the only farmer A or farmer B. Rather, that hurts the whole farming system. why because that will spread a negative impact you know to the other farmers that this business is not viable here people will look only the output the business failed they will not look why the business failed yeah you know and that we have seen here that we have witnessed here in hawaii people simply say oh it's not doable business but they don't think why it is not doable why it failed you mm -hmm. want to solve the problem you know identify the problem and then find a solution rather than simply saying the result you know mm -hmm. so my suggestion for commercial farmer will be having really business plan yeah all the feeding nutrition and management plan all the health plan all the biosecurity plan and then do it properly of mm -hmm. course they want to uh, know the basics of that production system what they are doing and then consult with the expert or subject matter especially time to time people like us you know who are yeah. there mm -hmm. to help them that so i have complete two different messages for two different farming system mm -hmm. yeah and i think it is a little bit it is different you know whether you're just it raising is. your own flock in the backyard or are doing it on a production mm -hmm. and a commercial correct. standpoint so correct there are different points that you need to really address so um you know i i i've, I've learned so much about you today dr ja <laughs> haven't known in all the sectors that you've worked right. it's such rewarding work it is um, working in extension and providing the outreach yeah. oh well thank you so much dr yeah. ja for joining us today we're so glad you're able to be on the show and having taking the time to so talk story with shannon yes, and you. i about poultry nutrition and we learned so much more about you and your um journey i should say edu academic journey here and um as you've been here in hawaii so i hope our listeners are able to gain some insight into poultry nutrition and how it impacts your flock yeah and thanks for having me actually thanks for giving me a chance to share some of my experiences some of uh, my thoughts and some of the information we have and and hopefully it will be helpful to our farmer uh, primarily to our hawaiian farmers and and beyond mm -hmm. and uh, as i mentioned earlier we at sitar uh, people are always there mm -hmm. uh, to help our farmer our people and we'll be more than happy always to help as much as we can do with our resources make sure to join our facebook page the livestock extension group if you haven't already and be sure to visit the uhc tar extension website and our youtube channel listed in the show notes 
For additional information about this topic, see Dr. Zha's animal nutrition website listed in the show notes of the podcast and the description box of our YouTube page. Thanks again for listening to the Livestock Fala Ao. And before we go, show some love for your favorite podcast. That's us. That's us. Leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite pa- platform. And stay tuned for next month's episode. Ahui ho and ma- mahalo everyone for listening. Bye.